Today, as you know, we're, I'm very honored and uh, grateful that Professor Patrick Royal is here today. The lecture um, is entitled Dreyfus, Vichy, De Gaulle, Chirac, Reflections on the French Jewish Malays. Uh, Professor Royal is a, he holds a, an appointment as a senior researcher at the French National Research Center, or the CR, CNRS in Paris. He is the senior transatlantic fellow to the German Marshall Fund of the United States to advise on issues of immigration and integration, and he's held this position since 2005. He is also the director of the Center for the Study of Immigration, Integration, and Citizenship Policies, or the CEPIC, at the University of Paris uh, 1, uh, or at the Sorbonne. Um, he's worked internationally. He's um, well published, as, as you know, in, for example, 2003, he served as uh, the French, on the French Presidential Commission on Secularism, which was established by Jacques Chirac and led to many uh, policy uh, um, uh, resolutions that were adopted, including models of integration in France. Um, he's been a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center in the United States and was a visiting uh, scholar at Harvard University. Uh, just sort of hot off the press, he has a new book entitled Liberté, Egalité, uh, Discrimination, uh, L'Identité Nationale au regard to l'histoire, or ident National Identity with regard to history. And he's touched on many issues of citizenship and integration um, over his illustrious career. And I think it's really an honor that he'll, he's here today to speak about very important historical issues with certainly contemporary implications. So, Professor Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your invitation and introduction. Uh, I apologize for my, for my very French English. I hope you will understand me. Um, and I will try to introduce, to speak about the, the situation in France toward the, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, the Jewish community, if I speak about that, of, from the point of view of some Jews who feel some malaise toward the, the, their country and the, the policy of States sometimes and the interaction they can have with some other groups of people living in the country. Uh, let me start by, by pointing what can appear as a, uh, as a paradox. You might have heard that, especially a few years ago, at the moment of the rise of the Second Intifada, you had some physical attack on Jews uh, that sometimes even lead to one, one death to a young, from a young, of a young uh, Jew who was tortured by a group of crazy uh, adolescents. And there was the expression of fear from the part of some Jews, uh, fear for their security and for their future in the country. At the same time, uh, well, especially uh, after the, the riots we, are, we have faced in the fall of 2005, after the passage of the bill uh, that prevent any uh, high schoolers to wear conspicuous religious sign in public school, there have been some international comparative study about the degree of tolerance among different European democracies and in comparison with some other uh, states, including the uh, United States and some Arab countries, Muslim countries, etc. And all the polls that have been made, all the data that has been collected, shows that it is in France that you have this, the highest degree of friendly interaction between groups uh, and the highest degree of cultural integration. Let me give you some, some 
example, to the, for example, the, there was a, a study made in 2006 by the Pew Research Center based in Washington, D.C., across 15 different countries. There was a question, do you feel yourself first a citizen of your country or a Muslim or a Christian? In the UK, and I will compare France and the UK only because in Germany or in Spain, many of the Muslims are not citizens because they are, in Germany, the citizenship law would prevent them to become citizens until 2000. And in Spain, they are from very recent uh, arrival in the country. 7% of the Muslims in the UK feel they are first citizen, and 81% feel they are first Muslim. In France, where half of the Muslims are foreigners, by law, 42%, and it's the highest percentage by, by any mean, feel first French, 46 first Muslim. Let me go to the US because it's interesting. Uh, for the Christian. The Christian in the US, 48% feel first citizen of the United States, 42 first Christian. And if you take France, the Christian, 88 first French, 14 first Christian. So you have some, some here you have a trend I will come back to. Now let, let me give you another answer, description of answer to another question. Do you have a favorable view of Muslim, Christian, and Jews? So let's speak about the Jews. Among the global population, United States, 77% have a favorable view of the Jews. France, 86. UK, 74. Germany, 69. Spain, 45. Among the Muslim, do you have a favor favorable view of the Jews? 71% of the French Muslims have a favorable view of the Jews. 38% of the German Muslims have a favorable view of the Jews. 32 in the UK and 28 in Spain. So it's, France is the only country where a majority of Muslims have a favorable view of the Jews, and not a small majority because it's 71%, and the other European country is around 30%, that have only 30% only who have a favorable view of the Jews. So how can you explain the malaise, sometimes the attack, and this, this, this picture, finally, if you take global data, because of course, even if you have 71% of the Muslims who have a favorable view of the Jews, you have still 29% who don't have this favorable view, and among these 29,000%, you, you might have some radical ones. <coughs> and, let me add here a footnote, France is a very interesting country for now and the future, because we are the country of Europe with the largest Muslim community, the largest Jewish community, the largest Buddhist community, and the largest atheist or agnosticist community, if I may say that. Because we are with the Czech Republic, the European country where the atheism and agnosticism is the more developed. So you have a, a sort of very interesting and complex picture of, of different attitudes toward religion and a very uh, diverse, uh, uh, a very big diversity of groups, of religious groups. So let's try to interpret this complex situation. As you have noticed, what is quite clear among the Catholic, among the Christian and among the Muslim is that in France, <coughs> You have, first of all, a strong influence, a strong influence of the public culture, of a strong affiliation to the state, based, in my opinion, I will try to base it on facts, 
on two factors. First of all, the tradition of secularism, which is set very particularly in my country, but works quite well. And secondly, the principle of equality before the law. It's a very strong principle, stronger in France than anywhere than, than in either, any other democracy. Let me to try to illustrate this hypothesis quote you uh, one of the founders of the American political science whose name was Francis Lieber. He was a, originally a German Prussian refugee in the US and ended as the first professor of political science at Columbia University in New York City. His best friend was a senator of Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, who was a hero of anti-slavery in the Senate. They were the best friend, but they were diverging in their relation to France and Germany. Lieber was uh, proud of his Prussian origin, and Sumner was a Francophile and a Francophone. Uh, who has traveled to France and very often. And after the victory of the Prussian Empire against France in 1871, they diverge on the uh, outcome of the war. And here what uh, Lieber writes to Sumner, his friend Sumner, in uh, the spring of 1872. I have received this day from Berlin a call to collect money among the German in America for a Bismarck Foundation in the University of Strasbourg. I shall send some money and be done with I suppose. The German government is evidently bent on making Strasbourg a first-rate university, which means something. The French neglected it shamefully, but they neglected and neglect everything except Paris. And here again, I come to my old question. What is it that makes the French the only people who can convert conquered people? They receive no benefit from France. Yet they speak for France. Germans, English, American, no one can do it. What is it? And my hypothesis is that Sumner had a thought. I, I didn't find the answer of Sumner in the letter. But I think he had an answer, in, he could have an answer in mind, as he has battled in the Senate for the introduction in the American Constitution of one article of the French Declaration of Human Rights about the equality before the law, which was not included, in the, which was not part of the American Declaration, because he was telling and writing that for him, the principle of equality before the law were the main was the main human right among the others. And if you come back to the situation of the German in Strasbourg, what was the story telling? That after the right attachment of Alsace to the Prussian Empire in 1871, despite all the money the German government was putting in, in Strasbourg, the people of Strasbourg continue to feel French, despite, that the, the, despite the fact that the French has done nothing for them for years. So why did they feel French in that situation? It is that under the French kingdom, and then after under the French Republic, their territory under the French kingdom, and their person under the French Republic, were equal to the Parisians. They were equal, they were the same, they were equal before the king and they were equal before the law after the French Revolution. As under the, the, the Prussian Empire, they were a colony. They were a colony with not, with not the same status than Prussia. They were colonized, a, 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 a colonial territory, and so they preferred the status of equality. And that is, I think, a strong illustration of what has brought 
the diversity of the French territory from the north to the south, all together within the French Kingdom and then within the French Republic, making a very diverse populations. Now, if it's a so strong, and, and let me add something here. This principle of equality has had big effect on the Jews after the revolution. The Jews, the French Revolution, was made the France the first country who gave the Jews totally full equality uh, as citizens. Of course, uh, this principle was attacked, was attacked by anti-Semites. And, uh, for example, the Dreyfus Affair illustrates the strength of anti-Semitism in France at the end of the 19th century. But contrary to what, of what I hear often in the US, when I was raised as a French Jew by my parents and grandparents, and for my grandparents, who almost has lived uh, the time of the Dreyfus Affair, or the, for them, the Dreyfus Affair was a symbol of justice and equality before the law within the French Republic. Because, of course, it, start, it started with injustice that a poor, innocent Jew was condemned and almost killed by his condemnation and his, his sending to the island of Guyana. But then, after a battle for this poor Jew, at that time, the Jew represented less than 1% or over 1% of the French population. And yet, half of the country mobilized itself for this guy and win the battle against the army, against the Catholic Church. And at the end, these two big institutions are defeated in front of the court and politically. And so, for the Jews of France, the Dreyfus Affair is a symbol that at the end, like in many history the Torah, it starts badly, but it ends well. In the interwar period, we had the Prime Minister, Leon Blum, who was the chief of the government, the highest politician in the country, at a time where Jews were not were forbidden to enter some universities, some club in the United States. So you had that paradoxical situation where at the same time you had a strong anti-Semitism in France at, in the interwar period, but the Republican anti-army, anti-Catholic were not at all anti-Semite and had elected a Jew as their chief. And he became the prime minister of a left-wing government. And so the, the Jews of France could identify themselves very well with the French Republic, who has given them rights, and even the highest rights, because you could be a Jew. Even if you were facing anti-Semitism by some groups, these groups were also attacking the Republic as a regime. And so you had a solidarity between the Jews, the Republicans, the Protestants, etc. And that worked like that. It was not an easy situation, but it was a clear one. What happened then, and make the thing, the story more complicated, is of course the Vichy situation, the Vichy regime. Because at that time, Jews faced direct and radical discrimination. And what I wanted, what I've dis, what I have done to understand what has happened better, because I think comparison is always better to understand the situation, is that because I have, I have worked on the issue of nationality and citizenship, I have considered all the groups that in the French history of the last century has had to face discrimination within the law. Because if I say that 
equality before the law is so important principle, what happens when this equality before the law is broken? So it has been broken for the Jews under the Vichy regime. But if you look at citizenship law, three other groups were discriminated against in the last century. First of all, the women. The women who married foreigners. They were deprived of their citizenship. They had to shift to the citizenship of their husband. That was also uh, the situation of American women during 15 years, between uh, 1907 and 1920. Imagine the situation. You marry an Italian, you become Italian. You marry a Chinese, you become a Chinese. And that was the situation in the French women between 1803 and 1927. And in the 20s, because we have become a very uh, important country of immigration, more than 200,000 women we are born French, but has become foreigners by marriage. Sometimes without knowing it and uh, willing it. And if they were civil servants, they lost their jobs. If they married an Italian, they couldn't divorce. If they married a Chinese and uh, they would go to China with their husband, they would discover they were, they were not the only wife. But they could not be protected by the French embassy because they had become Chinese by law. So that situation ended in 1927. Naturalized citizens also would not deserve the same rights than other citizens during the period from 1848 to 1984. They would not be able to vote or to be elected uh, or to get some job in civil service during that time. And that discrimination ended only in 1984. In the US, so you still have of provision, you cannot be president of the United States if you are a naturalized citizen. But it's, I think it's the only uh, discrimination uh, that faces a naturalized citizen. Then you have, beside the Jews, the Muslim from Algeria. Because officially, Algeria was France between 1848 and 1962. And yet, the Muslim from Algeria never got the full citizenship. They were formerly French for international law, but in terms of real statute, they were not fully French. And they had the same statute than the Jews until the Decret Crémieux of 1871 that nationalized all the Jews of Algeria. And then the foreigners who had settled in Algeria as colonels uh, also became French by uh, a nationality law that was open to uh, their situation uh, in 1889. So, excluded from this uh, inclusion to a full citizenship were the Muslims of Algeria, only 7,000 of them would become French during the century that goes from 1865 when the, there was a, a new law that permitted their admission to full citizenship until 1962 when independence of Algeria was established. So now let's look at these four groups. Among these four groups, only two of them have kept a sort of uh, suffering memory of the past discrimination. Not the women, not the naturalized, but the Jews and the Muslims. So, how to interpret this trace of memory, of suffering memory, uh, in the that remains in the daily life of these two groups. First of all, one can notice that the women were only a minority of women, 200,000, but there were like uh, 25,000, 25 million of women who didn't have the right to vote, and the right to vote became the, the 
first item on the agenda. And when this group of women uh, so who were split, not organized together, and who were a minority of women, became a, a large group, the discrimination ended in, 19, in, 20, in, in, uh, in uh, 1927. The naturalized, they, it was a top of period of discrimination after five to ten years, they will become full citizens, so it was not a permanent status. So what happened that uh, make the Jews and the Muslims keep a living and painful memory of the past? Uh, an historian, Henri Rousseau, who has worked on the Vichy period, has made a hypothesis. The hypothesis uh, that these Jews who cannot recover from the Vichy, who are, period, who are still speaking of Vichy permanently, suffer uh, obsessional neurosis. It's, a psycho psycho it's, it's borrowed from psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Uh, they suffer an obsessional neurosis because they are obsessed with Vichy. They consider that the history of Vichy and the persecution of Jews are, are not enough, is not enough, is still camouflaged. There's still a lot of things that have to be shown uh, that repression are not true enough recognition of, of their suffering, etc., etc. Yet, if you look at the history of Vichy history and memory, you might say that in the 1960s this history was not made, that reparation has not occurred, that memory has not been uh, emphasized, but nowadays it has happened. I mean, of persecution of Jews, you can still find things, but many books have been written. The history of Vichy has a leading scholar who is an American, Robert Paxton. The memory of this persecution has been is now celebrated every year by official ceremony of the French state. And reparation of financial reparation of the uh, action of the German and the French regime on Jewish families has occurred, especially uh, ten years ago, under the, the auspices of a commission called Matteo Lipoch. So Henri Rousseau says uh, you should now acknowledge that uh, all this recognition has occurred, uh, that uh, reparation also has occurred, and so you should now go to, uh, uh, think about the future and, 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 uh, and, and get out of your obsession. How can we read this interpretation? First of all, I think also it's true to say that some Jews are really still obsessed by Vichy. Not all, but some. And you might, the way they speak about it, you might say it's right. It's like, it looks like an obsession on neurosis, the way it's, it's described by Freud. But then they don't go enough further on with the analysis of what is an obsession on neurosis as described as Freud says about uh, obsession and neurosis, let me quote. Evoking obsession, Freud speaks of the association of an emotional state with an idea which is not the idea related to the obsession, 
but it is one that replaces it, a substitute for it. The replaced ideas have all have common attributes. They correspond to really distressing experiences in the subject life, which he is trying to forget. He succeeds merely in replacing the incompatible idea by another, ill-adapted for being associated with an emotional state, which for its part remains unchanged. It is the false connection between the emotional state and the associate idea that accounts for the absurdity so characteristic of the obsession. So what Freud explained here is that if you personally visit a psychoanalyst because you are obsessed by a, a fact or a person, the psychoanalyst will try to find the real cause of obsession that is not in, that is not in your discourse. If you arrive and speak about Vichy as obsessing you, obsessing you, then the role of the analyst would be to find the real cause of the obsession, which is not Vichy. So I've tried to do that. And my hypothesis is that these Jews, their problem is not Vichy. Their problem is another part of French history. And this part of French history is for me, and I will try to demonstrate uh, that, what has happened when De Gaulle, in a press conference a few months after the Six Day Wars, uh, spoke about the Jews as a people of elite, sure of themselves and dominating. This uh, statement about Jews provoked a terrible trauma, a shock, all across the Jews of France, from the most atheist, like Raymond Aron, to the, uh, the first rabbi, uh, all Jews reacted as being wounded by this statement that sounds like a condemnation and an abandonment of the Jews. And that made them, and this abandonment, made them come back to an abandonment they had felt, they had felt 20 years earlier with the Vichy. De Gaulle was a figure that you cannot attack. It's an intact entity. He was the father of the nation. He was the leader of the French resistance. He had, among the, among the, the resistance were Jews. The place of De Gaulle in relation to Jewish identity shift from the father because, well, the father who was protecting become the father who has abandoned you and condemning you. Let me give you uh, an example. Imagine you are a child. You come home from school and tell your father that your sworn enemy has beaten you up. And some hours later, your father replays not the gesture, but the words of his sworn enemy and claims you are wrong. What would wound you the most? The physical attack of this enemy or the wounding words of your father? Who has not understood your anguish and who has abandoned you? And it is what happened to the, to the Jews of France. For the Jews of France, the feeling of abandonment or incomprehension by the Jews produced an intensification of the trauma, which revived the Vichy prosecution in an inexplicable connection. Vichy was an e the enemy, the rhetorical enemy, the expected enemy, because antisemitism had been a powerful political ideology since the Dreyfus affair, 
but a provisionally victorious enemy carried in the luggage of the Nazi victory. But the goal was the protecting father, the son of the nation, the admirable man, but the untouchable hero. And it was so untouchable that attacking the goal after this war would risk the aggravation, the accusation of double allegiance already battered in the course of six, the Six-Day War, against which a response was difficult, since the solidarity of the state of Israel seems at the same time obvious for the Jews of France, but sometimes would question their, lo their loyalty or their affiliation with France for the, for the non-Jews. And so, as the goal was inattackable, the shift of anger, of claim, occurred towards Vichy. You can attack Vichy every day, and nobody would defend Vichy. You cannot face a critical democracy so easily. And so, for me, the Jewish malaise. On being an, in uncomfortable situation, being a French Jew and yet feeling great, uh, having great feeling toward Israel, came from that moment. And a way of dealing with it was becoming obsessed with Vichy, as you could not be obsessed with the goal, and as if you look at what was reported to Vichy, you can approach it to the De Gaulle. The De Gaulle archives are not open. You cannot ask for operation. You cannot uh, uh, criticize him, etc. And, uh, and the truth is not very well known about the history of De Gaulle because it's, a, it's not a ground for, yet for history. So what I want here to, to if, I, if I want to uh, sum up what I want to demonstrate here is that it's the second it's not the first trauma, the Vichy regime. It's a second one, it's a second traumatic uh, wound that has created by putting back the Jews to their past situation, the malaise they are feeling in the French Republic. Now, to be very rapid, you can find the same kind of structure with the Muslim of Algeria. As I told you, the Muslim of Algeria discriminated against during the whole period of the colonial era. Then, after 1962, when Algeria became independent, they were in a normal status in, in, in the French uh, territory. Until the 1980s, where some uh, right-wing forces want to change the nationality law, claiming that Muslim, especially Algerian, uh, young Algerian would not be so faithful to France and should be asked some special uh, procedure as to become French, a special procedure that, would, that didn't exist for the children of foreigners of the previous um, immigration waves of the century. The law was changed in 1993, and based on that law, the children of foreigners had to when they were born in France, had to claim their citizenship around their majority, and it was not anymore an automatic accession. The wound these children of Algerian perceived when the law was passed was incredibly higher than the real effect of the law, who are not touching them particularly because as children of Algerian, they would many times be French at birth, for reasons I can explain later. So how do I explain that they felt this wound so badly as a break with their affiliation to French citizens? For my opinion, in my opinion, it is that without knowing it, the French Parliament passed a bill that would make this young Algerian come back 
to the situation of their grandparents in colonial era. Because during the colonial era, their grandparents were formerly French, but if they wanted to become French, they had to go through a claim in front of the court or in front of the administrative authority. Exactly the same kind of procedure they were asked to do under the law of 1993. So this new provision that was restricting the, their access to citizenship was making them come back symbolically to the status of their grandparents. And it is that double trauma that provoked the break of affiliation between this young Muslim and the French state. Now, let me try to come back to what I said at the beginning. To explain the Jewish malaise, of course, you have the facts, some attacks on Jews. But if the attacks occur, if you look at the context I described, the context is more favorable for the Jews in France than it is in the UK or in Spain, as a, if you look at the general public attitude. But if it occurs in the context when many Jews feel uncomfortable with the French politics and policy since the war, then any attack, any incident involving one to ten person become very uh, sensitive for a group of people who have become very sensitive because uh, the goal <laughs> has made them uh, very uh, sensitive to their, uh, for their stability within the French society. To end the story with, where it should be, it is now, our new president, Mr. Sarkozy, what has he done against uh, some attack? Not more than the others. But what, he, what has he done towards the Franco Israeli relation? More than the others. And I think that what, what he has done on this issue has had the effect of creating an atmosphere among the Jews of France which is much more secure, much more relaxed, which means that now, for example, uh, two weeks ago there was a sort of remake of this uh, young Jew who was, uh, he escaped after six hours of uh, bad treatment, I would say. Two years ago it would have become the event, etc. Uh, that day, last two hours on the website of the main newspaper, and nobody spoke too much about it. Because I think that the, <coughs> the attitude of the new president toward Israel, uh, his claim of friendship and acceptation of, uh, and, his, and his valorization of being a Jew, a French Jew, and being feeling, having a good, uh, strong feeling toward Israel as, as making no problem, uh, I think has created a, a, an atmosphere of confidence that was not existing previously. And if my interpretation is good, then it reinforces the hypothesis I've tried to, to, to defend in front of you. Thanks.
reinforce this notion of uh, communal or ethnic identity, whereas in the French Republican model is more of a national identity and you keep your uh, different identities in the private sphere. So the fact that uh, there's such a huge difference, does it really indicate that things are better in terms of social relations or diversity better in France, or is it just a different some different approach, uh, some different, I would say, national identity. But let me mark that the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, was so uh, anxious about that situation that he has shifted the traditional British policy and he has encouraged and developed citizenship policy. You know, uh, on a real uh, kind of Republican model, you know, learning more the language, language changing, uh, uh, creating uh, Britishness, etc., trying to emphasize a ground of unity uh, beside diversity. And so he would not have done that if he was not afraid of the kind of data uh, that I just produced, because if uh, you are right saying that probably the values and the models that are, that are diffused at school and at the local levels are different. But you have many politicians in France who say our model doesn't work anymore. And I answer no. Our model doesn't work very well in, in the term of cultural integration. It doesn't work anymore on discrimination. We are not our, our tools are not adapted to face the discrimination minorities are facing on the labor market, on the housing market. But all the data that has been brought, not by French uh, institution, but by American or British uh, data collection, show that we are very good where we are not 100% successful, but we are much, much more successful than other countries. And let me tell you something here. Many countries, including the UK, when they had to deal with inclusion of minority, what did they do? They came to the US and said, let's do what the US are doing. But I think they didn't speak to the good persons. I mean, or the person who told them about the US didn't tell them the whole story. Because many academics speak about the model of diversity in the US. They don't speak about the tool of assimilation also in the US. The US, you have Pledge of Allegiance, Salute to the Flag, uh, uh, national anthems, uh, local uh, sports, competition, etc. That are tools of unification of, of, of a country. That doesn't, that doesn't exist in, the, in many European countries because if you propose that, send to the flag, people say you are a fascist. And, and so many uh, people, when they present the US model, they don't speak about the dimension of the, U, the US model that is the dimension of unity, of assimilation, which balance. The, the, the emphasis on diversity. And so, because it's only the picture of diversity that is sometimes uh, presented to introduce the US uh, tradition, some European countries are saying, okay, let's do the same. And they have forgotten the dimension of unity. That has been a big issue since the US were created. And, 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 and it's still an issue debated in the US. And so, uh, I would say that the French uh, forget, for, uh, didn't uh, don't deal very well with diversity. I mean, they have the tools to do it. It is what I have tried to show in my uh, recent uh, research and my books. We have the tools. We, we, the, the, our secularist system is totally open to diversity. Let me 
Paul Munchen. You know, we have a famous law of separation of church and state. 1905. It's so a liberal law that under this new law, what has happened for the Jews of France? Before 1905, the Jews, if they want to pray, had to, they had to go to a synagogue that was depending on what we call the French consistoire that has been created by Napoleon. There was no synagogue except the one depending on the consistoire. After 1905, freedom, total freedom, equality of all faiths, every Jewish group had their own synagogue. The German, the Poles, the liberal, the conservative, the traditional, everybody. And that's based on the law of 1905. And it's totally forgotten. You should not read the law just through the article you, you have about the head The law of 1905 is extremely liberal towards every faith. And I, I, for example, I have a grandfather who was a very religious Jew from German origin. He built a synagogue in the 30s based on the law that authorized him to do it. And so, uh, our, but that is even forgotten by the French. They don't know how to read their own law. <laughs> and, 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 and they don't know how to interpret it. And so we, we, we have this tradition that is very tolerant towards diversity. For example, contrary to the US and like the UK, we have always accepted dual citizenship. There is no pledge of allegiance to our France uh, uh, when you are naturalized. You can keep your citizenship of origin since ever. Uh, that's very liberal. And, and, and yet, we don't emphasize that liberalism. We, we just introduce ourselves sometimes as this Republican, you know, Unitarian, Jacobin. But it's not the reality of the, of the law and even of the practices. I appreciate the, uh, the numbers you presented and your effort to, uh, to write these scales a little bit in terms of public opinion. What I can't quite accept is to call the Vichy thing an obsession. Because is it, you mentioned that there are other parties that are also badly affected, women, Nigerians, and so on. But it's quite different when, according to my information, the Vichy actually went beyond what the, what the Germans interested by the topic, there is a book recently published by a young colleague, we are just discussing it, Laurent Joly, about the history of the Commissariat General de Question Juive, who was the body who was created by Vichy as to wrong the Jews, as to deport them, as to deprive them of their property, etc. And he has totally reorganized the chronology and the policy of the Vichy regime and uh, against a lot of uh, older, I would say, scholars. And I personally totally agree with his approach that would put Vichy on the higher responsibility because he showed that the real shift toward an active antisemitism of deportation start very early in January 1941 with Amiral Darlan negotiating in some way uh, the stabilization of his position as a 
prime minister of Pekin against the deportation of Jews. But the deal with the German, you might have heard of it. The deal is I give I will give you all the farmers. I want you to let to let me protect the French and I give you all the farmers. And then under that deal, the, the naturalized become a, a big issue because the naturalized can be denaturalized under some Vichy law that has been borrowed from the German land <coughs> from the Nazi regime. So it's a, it's a very complex story. You cannot say they have been, uh, no. They have been negotiating with the Nazi, they have been participating to the show, to the industry of the show, I mean, to the deportation. They, but they have, you know, they have uh, made deals, they have, uh, uh, you cannot say they have been, uh, uh, they have been, uh, Uh, what I think is that uh, let, me, let me tell you frankly, I am myself uh, the son of uh, people who were under threat, my parents, both of my parents, uh, of being deported and killed, and who escaped. One of my, my family from my father's side went to the US and the other they crossed the border to Switzerland. And I was I was raised on the uh, the story of that period and the fear of the German, the Nazi and being uh, forced to leave my country anytime in case of dark. I remember I was as a child I was thinking I need to be able to do my luggage every morning if, if it's necessary because it can come back. And so when I read also saying we should get rid of that obsession, I, I must say that if you are a person who has suffered, for example, from deportation, I, must, I would like to mention Simone Veil. You don't want your children or your grandchildren to live with that, they, know, they, they need to know what has happened. But they should not be blocked in living a good life because of that history, if it's possible. And it is why <coughs> I think it's not, uh, I was not, uh, I didn't uh, agree with the obsession theory of Rousseau. I was using it some parts of the Jews who uh, as a need to make them coming out from suffering even more today than even in the, in the year following the war. And when Simone Veil, I spoke, uh, it, it is not often that I, that I speak favorably with, about Mr. Sarkozy because I'm a strong critic of his immigration policy. But let me criticize him on one thing he has, you know, he has heard that he has announced that he wants every child of France to adopt one of the Jewish child who has been deported and killed. And Simone Veil, the day after, came to the to speak to the press and say, it's a terrible idea, it's totally crazy. How do you, when you want to have a child of 10 years old, bear the responsibility of what has happened, it's ridiculous. You need to, you need to learn history, you need to have, for example, a classroom, go to a place where you are, to learn what has happened, but to have an individual responsibility when you are 10 years old, and you, it's really, it's, it's really a bad idea. So I think, uh, the, the, the complicated issue here is that it's very important to keep memory of what has happened. But it's not, it's also very important to keep a memory that is active, that is positive, that uh, provoke action against discrimination of today. Here in this room, you have a, one of my former students of an organization called Humanity in Action, 
who has been created by a, a woman called George in New York. And we have a program in France and in many European countries. And we try to, to base action of the prisons based on, form of, 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 on historical discrimination. But it is, what is, I think, a good approach that we have to get out of the, of the suffering, if it's possible, of course, and go to the future, to the present, with the values uh, that are the key to resist uh, uh, the coming back of the terrible uh, part of history the Jews have faced in the 40s. Hello, and then Jean-Claude Bernard. Yeah, I uh, want to take you more to uh, current times. Um, I would say around uh, five years ago, uh, there were uh, riots, uh, mainly uh, tension between uh, Muslims and Jews, and they were uh, reported in the media. And through that, there was a big influx of uh, Jewish uh, immigrants going to Israel and to the US. So, you had a rise of Jewish immigration to Israel, for example. But you know the numbers? You know the numbers? I think the numbers was the rise from 1,500 to 3,000. You know that they actually affected the real estate market in Israel dramatically? No, let me, let me add something. It's not because French buy property in Israel that they all move. For example, my grandfather bought a property after the war of 1967 in Germany. He was never going there, but he was going there once, one week per year. And he, had, he has his apartment, he wanted to have it. It's not because you have a property that you move. You want sometimes to have a property to be sure that if anything happens, you can move there. Okay? Okay. Okay, so that's my first remark. My second remark, my second remark is about what you say, the memory, and I think a good point, something I've done much. There is a common history. Arab and Jews were in Algeria. And what? No, but especially in Algeria, in Morocco, in Tunisia, but in Algeria it's very special. Because in Algeria, for the Arab Muslim, the Jews had a favorable status. They were a demi minority on the Turkish French colonization, and with the French they become uh, full French. So there was always a sort of tension, uh, sometimes uh, teased by anti-Semitic people, etc., etc. So I do deny that there was, uh, there, there, is a, there is a potential of Tension, but I must tell you, also the big riots were not between the Jews and the Arabs. The big riots were between the Arabs and blacks, mainly, and the police. The Jews were not part of this riot you see on the television. There was no. The, the, the tension was more uh, towards the small incidents that became very. Uh, creating a lot of fear, but there was not.
And for the rest, uh, you know, uh, we, we, what I, what I uh, tell you is that for what I get uh, is that uh, the, the person of Sarkozy since the arrival of Sarkozy at the presidency, among the Jews who are afraid, in our city in France, and you have more and more Jews who are commuting, I would say. But uh, <coughs> I mentioned part of my family, they moved in 1968, after the war of 1967. And now, much more on the other side of the like, like so I think some American, some Jewish American, Israeli American, who have, whose parents have moved uh, 30 years ago, the children are Israelis, and now they go in York and they go back in France, etc. So you have this. Phenomenon that exists not only between Israel and France, but also between France and Algeria and Tunisia and Turkey, etc. And I recently participated to a, a conference uh, with a very official, with the ambassador, minister, etc., uh, about you know, the project of Mediterranean Union. Israel, uh, uh, Lebanon, etc., and uh, all North African countries. And the reality now is that you have millions of people uh, along the Mediterranean Sea who have dual or triple citizenship and who can circulate. For example, you have more, and more Moroccan Jews who have the Moroccan citizenship, the French, and the Israeli. So, to end my answer, I must say that we don't know what is the future of that, uh, but I like my country in the it is now. I mean, the challenge we have to face to be a model of tolerance and civilism is a split diversity. But there is also a lot of uh, interaction going on that is very fruitful. I, just, just very, I want to interject very quickly in the spirit of um, keeping the conversation going. Follow up with Gus and along past you. Uh, can you comment very briefly on the fact that it seems, I, I lived in Paris and I didn't do a sociological study, but it seems to me that the fear of anti Semitism among the Sephardic North African community. <laughs> is much more powerful, it seems, than the actual because the assimilated Jewish community. So if there because in a lot of on the streets there is a palpable fear and is it the trauma of De Gaulle and Vichy or is there something in terms of anti Semitism on the ground in, in France? So, I think it is a part of the idea that uh, they are being forced to leave their country. After 67, because of the struggle they are facing, living in Morocco or Tunisia, uh, Algerian Jews also have been forced to leave the country of, you know, where they were living since generations before the people of the Arabs in, the, in, in Algeria. So I think it's a difference of history. And uh, as I was mentioning to you, one should not forget that some, what some people called the old anti from the white uh, Catholic uh, right people still exist. And myself, you know, my name is really you know, I cannot tell you that I am a Jew. Why is the most common Jew in, in France? Uh, I am a specialist of who are who are the immigrants in France. Not so the Jews, many Arabs, many Muslims, many blacks, etc. So I'm dealing with people knows immediately when they read my name that they are a Jew. And I must say that since the last 30 years I've been acting in that field of 25 years, I have faced, not many times, but the few times I have faced anti-Semitism, I 
Proverbs, etc., was more for the old antecedents than for antecedents coming from Arab the Black. And that is not too, too much anymore described and analyzed, but it still <coughs> exists strongly. But you know, when you look at the data, I always want to come back to that. All data shows that you have nine percent. You look at nine percent of the population who, when they answer to some question, it shows that they are antisemites or they have some antisemitic feeling. I think in the interwar period, there were about forty percent. When when Leon Blum became a prime minister, the leader of the opposition who spoke in the parliament. Against Leon Blum becoming prime minister, started this speech saying, for the first time in its history, this old Cal Cal Roman country will be run by a Jew. And he spoke, and he was applauded frenetically on the right side of the parliament, and he received hundreds of letters of congratulation. That was in 1936. So I think, I think you know, antisemitism and racism will always exist. The problem is at which level, and we, we win against it. It was a battle. You cannot hope for the disappearance of this feeling among human beings. What you can hope is about the marginalization and victory of the value of respect and universal universalism. But the hope of
for the uh, Jewish people coming from uh, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, second treason of the Gaulle, as we could say, uh, makes them very uncomfortable as, uh, as full fascists. There was a question about did, uh, there were, were, were the French authorities late in recognition? Yes, I think so. Uh, I, was, uh, I know that, that for some uh, leaders, and including you know, every serious affair, uh, Jewish leader that in the daily life, life of, a, of an Arab or a black French in terms of perception of discrimination is of course much more difficult than the life of a French Jew. So for the public authority who knows that, especially on the left, you know, there is this idea that First question about uh, the risk of first of all, uh, we have been facing fundamentalism and, and, and a terrorist attack before the United States. We have been attacked by terrorist groups since the 1980s. In the, in the 1980s, in the middle of the 1990s, and we have reacted, we have reacted very strongly but, but quite efficiently because since 1985. change our law and created the anti-terrorist uh, judicial process that is Secondly, uh, I would say that uh, contrary to the UK, we do welcome all the fundamentalist uh, religious uh, thinking that uh, because we will welcome them, they will not We deported them uh, as much as we could uh, legally. So you have really tough, tough control of uh, any fundamentalist uh, uh, groups. Now, I must say, you, you might be right. I mean, I remember that uh, some uh, very small minority can influence uh, a larger uh, part of the group. I think the key here is Respect or give equal opportunities to everybody uh, to respect their face, but to, res to make them respect. Uh, Let me give you an example. I have a, 
I have few students who are Asian in origin, PhD students. One came from a very uh, low family, illiterate parents. I was a teacher in history in high school. And you know, I had one year of training before becoming a master. And I helped him as Exam preparatory, or he was first world war, things I don't know. And one day he was in this cycle, and one professor said, We have to talk about the Israeli Palestinian conflict. And I said, What? It's not in the program, of course. And the professor said, Yes, but your name is. Uh, Jewish students. Why do you talk to me about that? You would not tell another French about his origin. So, in this issue of the respect of them, what is very complicated is that at some point, totally neutral toward the origin of the person. And at some other Festival, people stop working, etc. So, at the training, at some moment, you have to be responsible of diversity, at some moment, you have to be neutral uh, on that person has a different background than yours. And that is not done yet in my country. And it's what has happened. Uh, I have started two of these young guys were killed for, for no reason. And, and so uh, we have to change that because otherwise we will go to the reverse. So the picture I want to, to, to show here is that when you analyze the situation of a country, sometimes you have this red line. Works in one side and doesn't work in the other side. The other side that doesn't work is the one I just described to you. And if we don't make it work, then we can lose where we are good in cultural integration.